Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Barbara Metcalf. Thank you very much indeed, Tony, and thank you all for being here. Bhopal. Colonial Bhopal was one of hundreds of princely states together covering a third of British India whose rulers were promised support and internal autonomy in return for loyalty. Out of strategic considerations, the British not only preserved the Bhopal dynasty, uh, but subsequently, for over a century, beginning in 1819, they supported four women rulers as well. This kind of matriarchal succession was a complete anomaly among the princes and wholly unprecedented among Afghan Pathans or Pashtuns, the ruler's ethnic group of origin. Nawab Shah Jahan Begum, the princess of the title, was the third of these Afghan women, uh, and you see her here. In the 1880s, Shah Jahan faced the greatest crisis of her career when two larger-than-life figures collided, her scholarly and ambitious Nawab consort, Sadiq Hassan Khan, and Sir Lepel Griffin, strong-willed, also ambitious, one of the foremost civil servants who held the powerful position of agent to the Governor General for Central India. So the Sadiq Hassan, the Islamic intellectual, Lepel Griffin, whom you see lounging in this picture. Issues about the woman question and about Islam were at stake for the colonial rulers and Indians alike. The Bhopal rulers were part of new Islamic reform movements with new visions for the roles of women and Islamic intellectuals. The colonial rulers, on their part, had revived fears about Islamic activism. Sadiq Hassan, the husband, cultivated extensive reformist networks across India and beyond. Shah Jahan Begum adopted seclusion, purda. Practices like this were in the end sufficient to supply Sir Lepel Griffin with the boogeymen of sedition, fanaticism that proved the upper hand in the struggle. In a portrait taken in Calcutta roughly a decade before the crisis, Shah Jahan Begum stands amid the studio, the typical studio props, signaling colonial style drawing room respectability. Table, vase, book, parasol. She gazes forthrightly ahead. Note the robes and heavy insignia of the Star of India. This was an order one of those invented orders designed to unite selected Indian rulers and British officials as common feudatories of the Queen. And look again, she is wearing English style boots, European style gloves, and even a frock. But her headdress is traditional, as are her fitted churidar pajama. This was colonial style dressing a la mode. In 1875, a piece on Shah Jahan appeared in the Indian Charavari, a periodical published in Calcutta modeled on London Punch by and for the local British community. It was labeled a good example. And the author expressed astonishment that the advocates of women's rights in Britain, that's the advocates of women's rights, they use that expression, had not invoked Bhopal's female rulers. The current ruler, they continued, was improving her territories, pursuing her literary tastes, even writing for newspapers. She had, moreover, chosen as her husband a self-made man to assist her. Bhopal, they reported, was the model state of India. The image accompanying the text was a caricature based on the photographic portrait. And as caricatures often do, it told a different story. Shah Jahan Begum turns out not to be a good example at all, but a cautionary one. 
All the symbols of colonial respectability are gone. Shah Jahan seems to have a five o'clock shadow. Her pose is arguably in a more masculine style. Instead of those tidy fitted leggings, she wears flowing, flowered maybe, pajamas. She totters on tiny fancy shoes, on feet as insubstantial as the legs of the chair on which she leans. She is old and as old and as plump as Queen Victoria. And like the queen, she holds a scepter. There's now a map hanging over the chair. Well, you might think that would be a map of Bhopal, Bhopal, which the British called the second most important Mohammedan state. But in fact, it's labeled Barataria. This is the fictional island awarded to Sancho Panza in Don Quixote and a byword for a nonsensical imaginary kingdom. Some of you may know it from uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Gondoliers, subtitled The King of Baratari. Yeah. So there's the drawing. In short, mocking, assertive womanhood, royal power, princely India, all at once. And of course, entertaining its readers because in this they have their stereotypes confirmed. And additional stereotypes lay ahead, above all about Islamic activism. Evident especially in the aftermath of the great uprising of 1857 across North India, when Muslims were disproportionately blamed, these fears reemerged in the 1880s. British support for the Ottoman Sultan had waned. His attempts to forge a transnational pan-Islamic presence fueled suspicion. And events like the revolt of the Mehdi, the Mahdi of the Sudan raised alarms. To some concern, to some extent, these concerns were balanced in India by a policy uh, that minority Muslim elites might be made a loyal bulwark along with the princes against emerging, emerging nationalist critiques of colonial rule. So you might think that the Bhopal ruler, a prince, and a Muslim would have been safe. But as a woman, could she be trusted? And especially with a husband who was an Islamic activist. Add to that new expectations about limiting the role of loyalty in England as in India, many colonial officials sought ways to marginalize princely power in general. Allegations of sedition could be a justification for doing so. And for that, the finger pointed to Sadiq Hassan Khan, who had in any case been an unlikely spouse for a woman of the Bhopal ruling family. Marriages were supposed to be arranged by family elders. They were supposed to take into account property, power relationships, and status. And that's exactly what had happened with Shah Jahan's first marriage arranged by her mother, the figure in the center there, Nawab Sikandar Begum, her predecessor, who had decided on her daughter's first, as it turned out to be unhappy marriage in 1855, picking one of her loyal advisors, a Pathan, a military man, a man twice Shah Jahan's age and twice married with children. And Shah Jahan was not a docile wife and she chafed above all at this husband's uh, uh, insistence on seclusion. The, we have a, an account from a French visitor, Louis Rousselet, who was at the court when this first husband died. Rousselet went off to offer his condolences, um, and to his astonishment, there was Shah Jahan. For the first time, he saw her unveiled, walking down the hall toward him, and as he writes, she held out her hand and shook hands with him in the English fashion. He tried to express his condolences, and at least what he says is she replied with a single word, kismet, um, and then started grilling him on European affairs. 
uh, Gousselet went to his, her, her mother, who was a great friend of his, he was there for uh, a few months by that point, and asked him, her, to explain what was going on, and she said, does the prisoner regret his jailer, or her jailer in this case? Shah Jahan Begum soon took on a new life. Her grandmother and her mother had both ascended the throne as widows, as she did, and they had subsequently operated as what you might call unisex Pathan chiefs. They dressed as males, they rode, they directed their own troops, which in the case of her mother, Sikandar Begum, meant leading her troops, organizing her troops to support the British during the mutiny. Um, a very prudent move, as it proved. When Rousselet met Sikandar, he wrote, or describing this meeting, he wrote, her intelligent eyes express such a singular amount of energy that one must be aware of it beforehand in order to realize the fact that a woman is before you. Her gestures and manners still less remind one of her sex. Dress at the court, he reported, was the same for women and men. And Shah Jahan Begum changed all that. Here she is, presenting herself as a new style woman in this, depicted in this painting in modest female dress in a domestic setting. And again, it's worth looking at the details of the painting. A clock pointing to colonial initiated timekeeping, book, pen, paper, and blotter, evidence of her education and her role not only as a ruler, but as an author, as a writer, the tablecloth's English style embroidery most likely was her own. Um, a a uh, evidence, I think, of new practices of domesticity seen as part of the new patriarchy of the era. And marrying Sadiq Hassan Khan in 1871 stamped Shah Jahan Begum as part of that change. Hindu and Muslim elites alike had looked down on widow remarriage as vulgar, even impure. All elite women, moreover, had married only within their status group. Shah Jahan Begum broke both taboos. And she was a poet, published poet, in fact, publishing collections of her Persian and Urdu poetry. And here is the chronogram she published about the marriage. I arranged at God's order my second nuptial bond with Sadiq Hassan Khan of the Sayyid's conjunction from the lips of Shah Jahan Begum Shirin, that was her pen name, sweet, hear this, of the sun and the moon, a conjunction. She may speak sweetly, but she did it. She did it with divine sanction. She married a Sayyid, and it was a marriage made in heaven, an astronomical conjunction of sun and moon, the prelude to the auspicious crescent of both Muslim and Hindu calendars and symbol of new beginnings. Not everyone agreed. Oppositional family factions soon arose, led by her only child, Sultan Jahan Begum, the heir apparent as well as her, his, her husband and his large family. They denounced Sadiq Hassan as a nobody, someone who had arrived as a virtual peddler at the court. He was, they said, a schemer and a tyrant who advanced only his own interests. What did she expect when she made this marriage? It's easy, I think, to guess at Sadiq Hassan's appeal. He was a man driven by a passionate cause. He was a master of words in multiple languages. He was a world traveler, reaching out to Arab intellectuals in particular. In 1871, at the time of the marriage, he was newly back from an extended trip to the Hejaz for Hajj and interactions with leading scholarly circles. Shah Jahan readily entered into his life. By the close of the 19th century, an Urdu public sphere, one might call it, 
buzzed with competition over correct Islamic interpretation and authority.